So let's take a look at Engel's theorem, which is a theorem about subalgebras of a general linear algebra whose elements are all nilpotent. So in this video, we're going to look at perhaps like a, a basic fact, uh, two basic facts that we'll use to prove Engel's theorem. So this will be kind of part one, and then there'll be part two, part, perhaps part three even, um, where we slowly develop Engel's theorem. So to begin, we'll start off with two important results, which are one, um, let, let's start off with the, our assumptions, which is suppose x element of g l of v is nilpotent. Um, and uh, I should, I'll say dim v is finite because we'll need it in Engel's theorem, but I don't know if we need it here. So dim v is finite. Um, and so the first fact is that there exists v, element of v, not equal to zero, such that xv is equal to zero. And the second fact is add x is also nilpotent under this supposition. And so there, these are actually very easy to prove. And I hope this video is less than five minutes. So the first one goes as follows. Let's just say that x to the n is equal to zero because x is uh, nilpotent. And x to the n minus one is not zero because we can always find the smallest such n, such that x to the n is equal to zero. This is without loss of generality. So if x to the n minus one is not zero, then x to the n minus one, oops, I meant to say x to the n minus one quantity, <clears throat> times v is not equal to the zero subspace. <clears throat> and so what's nice about this is that I can find a vector in this guy, we'll call him p, which would obviously be of the form x to the n minus one times v for some v in big V. And we know that this guy is not equal to zero. Well, not necessarily, but we can pick p such that he's not equal to zero, right? Because the space is not zero. So then we're done, we're almost done. Like we'll just say x times p is equal to x times x to the n minus one times v is equal to x to the n times v, which is equal to zero times v, which is equal to zero, done. So we found our v and v such that x v is equal to zero. In particular, it's this p, which is x to the n minus one times some v, right? So that is great. So this is a proof for one. Now let's do proof for two. Proof for two is also very simple. So once again, assume x to the n equals zero. So what we're gonna do is recall that add x, right, in the general linear algebra is equal to x or let's say add x acting on y is equal to xy minus yx. So this can be thought of as left multiplication by x acting on y minus right multiplication by x acting on y. So I'm using lx to denote left multiplication by x and rx similarly. So we can say add x is actually equal to lx minus rx. And so observe that lx and rx are actually uh, commutative, they commute with each other, right? This is because of associativity. It doesn't matter if I left multiply by x and then right multiply by x, or if I right multiply by x and then left multiply by x, which is perfectly fine. So because they commute, they encourage us to consider um, raising this to some power. So in particular, I'm gonna choose add x to the two n, which is this n here, um, and you'll see why momentarily. So add x to the two n is equal to lx minus rx the 2n, which is equal to 2n choose i times i equals zero to 2n um, times, because they commute, we can just flat out apply the binomial formula, rx to the 2n minus i times minus one to the 2n minus i, right? So now consider add x's action on an arbitrary y, or add x to the 2n's action on some arbitrary y. This is equal to this guy, lx, minus rx to the 2n acting on y. And so this is equal to i equals zero, 2n. I'm gonna move all the constants out front because they don't affect anything, the scalars, minus one to 2n minus i. And so really, it's gonna be rx to the 2n minus i acting on y, which is just gonna be left multiplication by x to the n minus i times. And it's gonna be lx of i times y, which is gonna be left multiplication by x i times. So great, what do we do from here? Well, 
you shouldn't observe something, which is that these these powers of x, right? It's either i is greater than or equal to n, or 2n minus i is greater than or equal to n, based on the, the range of i here. So this is fantastic, because we know x to the n is 0. So either x to the i is 0, or x to the 2n minus i is equal to 0. So this is actually always going to be 0. So if add x to the 2n times an arbitrary y is always going to give you 0, you conclude that add x to the 2n equals 0. Great. We just proved our result. We have add x is nilpotent. So keep these in mind. We're going to need them for the next part. That's it for this video. Uh, we can prove our first formulation of Engel's theorem in the next one.